So this is uh, a person I want to tell you about. This is Mohammed Hakmi. He is a full stack engineer on our team at Bonfire. And I'd like to tell you his journey onto our team because it's actually far more interesting than mine. So like a lot of software developers, geeks, I, I, I use that term and I made sure that it was okay with Mohammed that I could uh, group him in with us, us geeks. Uh, it starts young, right? He, his family got their first computer. They got it for his sister who was writing essays for school. And when his sister was away, Mohammed would sneak into her room and try to figure out how to program this thing. And his parents, like mine, you know, began to become concerned, thinking he should focus more on school and other things. But by high school graduation, Mohammed was top ranked in programming amongst students in Homs, Syria, where he lived. Uh, he enrolled in computer engineering at Al Bath University. And while in university, ran a side hustle bringing a local bookshop online. All of this shattered in 2011. Uh, Mohammed was writing a university exam when a rocket slammed into the building next to where he was writing the exam. And when he went back home, he could hear gunfire in nearby Clock Tower Square. And so Syria's civil war not only threatened the safety of Mohammed and his family, uh, it was likely that it would draw him and his brother into forced military service. And so they had to leave. Fleeing to neighboring Lebanon, they found refuge with an aunt living in Beirut. And as one and a half million Syrians came to this country of four and a half million, uh, what you might you know, be able to understand happened, populist politics started arising. And policies and government uh, things came in that really limited the rights of, of refugees who didn't have status in this country. So they couldn't send their kids to public school, you couldn't access healthcare. In fact, the only jobs that you could legally hold were construction and farm labor. So what are you gonna do if you're a geek like me or Mohammed? Uh, he worked illegally as a software developer, paid under the table, but at half the market rate. And every day uh, on his way to work, Muhammad would pass a, a, a sign like this one uh, in Arabic that read, to Syrian laborers, the hand that reaches for our jobs will be cut off, um, threatening you know, that you do not have status to work in our country, don't try to take our jobs. And for eight years, Muhammad lived with his uh, extended family in this two bedroom apartment, you know, barely scraping by, Amazingly, Mohammed uh, got the money together, uh, completed his university degree while working, while supporting his family, all these things. But really, where could they go from there? There was just no kind of clear path to, to get out of that cycle and find a more permanent, um, permanent place. So Mohammed's story fits within this global reality. Currently, there are more people displaced, fleeing conflict and disaster, than at any point in history since the Second World War. And this is the global refugee crisis that you'll hear about, and the, the, is the focus of humanitarian resettlement efforts, such as Canada's welcome of 40,000 refugees, Syrian refugees, since 2015. We really do have a lot to celebrate in Canada about our welcome of refugees. Uh, we really do play quite an amazing role in the world. The sad reality is, though, that less than 1% of those displaced people with no permanent place to settle are resettled every year, and that number is declining. I looked up last year, so you see 25.9 million, 92,000 were resettled. So just this, this fraction of a percent are actually getting resettled into permanent places to rebuild their lives. And uh, it's just something that is a, of a scale that much more needs to happen. And I think Canada could play a larger role. Here's another reality that many of us know, maybe may, many of us probably experience more, which is that really great talent is very, very hard to find. It's probably top of mind if you're a growing tech company and scaling up uh, that it's so hard to find. In Waterloo Region, we consistently have over 2,000 tech roles that are open. I've had roles that have been open for months where we try to find the right person. Uh, I was reading that in um, Nova Scotia, there's a target of 7,000 uh, 
uh, immigrants per year trying to bring to the region to address skills gaps. It's predicted by 2035 in Canada, we will need 350,000 people from outside of Canada to choose to come and work in Canada to address skills gaps. We're, we as a country will need that, and we've built a large and open economic system to support that, and that's what we need for our future growth as a country. Uh, so what if humanitarian resettlement wasn't the only pathway to resettle refugees? Uh, Talent Beyond Boundaries, a Washington DC-based NGO, has gone out to, with this thesis, and they've gone to two pilot areas that have high concentrations of displaced people, Jordan and Lebanon, and they've identified 15,000 skilled candidates in those areas. They have uh, degrees, many of them advanced degrees, they've got job experience and skills in in-demand fields, and language proficiency uh, for English and French. And they've identified these candidates. Um, unfortunately, until recently, there was no viable way that you could hire from this candidate pool. The economic, or the economic stream that I've mentioned that we rely on in Canada was unavailable to refugees for a variety of reasons. And the humanitarian stream took far too long, on the order of two years, for a business to say, I'll offer you a job, I'll see you in two years. Uh, that job will be ready for you in two years when you could make it plus or minus six months. Uh, so something needed to be done to unlock this candidate, candidate pool for hiring. So uh, in this year, we'll uh, welcome 200,000 economic immigrants using these streams. And uh, it does seem like this uh, misconnection is what we might think of in the startup world as a, uh, an inefficient industry ripe for disruption, right? On one hand, you've got Canada needing talent. On the other hand, you've got the supply of very skilled people that are displaced in places that they cannot use those skills. So it seems like you know, a, a, a startup mentality of how do we disrupt this thing uh, that can, makes connections seems like the kind of thing that tech does very well. And so uh, the question is, could we have the creativity and ingenuity to make those kind of connections? So that's exactly what Talent Beyond Boundaries set out a number of years to do. And for the first few years, they were laying the groundwork. They were on the ground in Jordan and Lebanon and trying to identify the talent and make the connections there. They were also working in the countries that could permanently resettle those skilled candidates. Mohammed, back to him, uh, he first heard about Talent Beyond Boundaries through a Facebook post. And he tells me that when he read it, it sounded too good to be true, like it might be a scam, and he was skeptical. But Talent Beyond Boundaries had an office in Beirut, and he visited. And after overcoming uh, those initial questions, he worked for three years, and the staff at Talent Beyond Boundaries worked for three years preparing Mohammed for international placement. They worked on job, language, interview skills. On the, across on the other side of the planet, Omar, one of the co-founders of Bonfire, went to Corey Flatt, our CEO, and told him about TBB's mission. And he shared this global context and said, so Talent Beyond Boundaries has been working for a number of years. They want to make this happen. They're looking for the first company to take a leap and just do this thing. And Corey thought about it for a short period and just said, yeah, we should do that. And so when I started at Bonfire at the beginning of last year, one of the first things, actually on my first day, I was kind of passed a file. It was the information from Talent Beyond Boundaries, and it was, Here, here's this program. Figure out how we're going to do this. We want to hire through, through Talent Beyond Boundaries. So you might be curious, what kind of challenges are present recruiting from a remote uh, refugee candidate pool. How hard is it to do that recruitment and hiring process? Well, I can, I can really share that there are advantages to this method that actually outweigh the challenges that you'll, you'll often experience during it. So um, to start, the uh, Talent Beyond Boundaries, their 15,000 candidates that they put into a 
uh, a talent catalog, it presents a real advantage to the normal recruitment pipeline. Because the market is so hot, you'll find that normally you're getting candidates coming in at various times. We have two internal recruiters, and we were looking back, especially on our team, the engineering team, and realized that almost everyone that we've successfully recruited was someone that our recruiters reached out to, not someone who applied as an inbound request. The market's just too hot. You can't wait for people to come to you. You have to go to them. And so with Talent Beyond Boundaries, we shortlisted a set of candidates, started those conversations, scheduled them all in a block so that uh, our team was disrupted less, you know, across a bunch of time, and we had concentrated interviews. And it also helped us run a really tight uh, decision, strong decision-making process where we could select the best candidate in a, in a finite amount of time and not play these games around timing of offers that are gonna explode at a certain time and all of that kind of thing. So it really helped us run a good recruitment process. There definitely are, uh, your, your, the interview process for us was much the same, but over Skype. Uh, and you do have to deal with the occasional connectivity problem or a language barrier. At one point with one of the candidates, uh, things were going really well and suddenly they stopped responding as we were conversing with them uh, over email and they missed a deadline. And I was annoyed. To me it felt like we're, we're doing all this, you know, could, you could at least keep uh, engaging. But when we found out a few days later, that they had had to suddenly return to Syria to help a relative in need, uh, we happily rescheduled. The, a little bit of flexibility is needed, but it's not that much, and it actually is part of the process of building a good trust relationship with someone who could be, become part of your team. If I could pass on our top learning from just the, the, the recruitment part of the process, it's that Technical, take home technical assignments work so well in this context. We have long relied on them domestically, but have had to scale them back because we find now candidates come and they've got five other offers and they don't have the time or the interest to spend time working on a special assignment in their own time. Uh, instead, with TBB, the candidates were all too eager to show off their skills. And with Muhammad, it was how we knew we had the stellar candidate on our hands. We taught, you know, he did his assignment, we brought him online, we started talking through it, and as we were talking through um, the merits of doing things with JavaScript promises in a certain way, and node servers, and Elasticsearch clusters to provide certain parts of the functionality of what he had done, uh, all kind of barriers of communication evaporated and we just knew this person is outshining many of our recent domestic interviews. We need to get this person onto our team. So after we offered Muhammad the job, our team began expectantly waiting with him. Uh, Talent Beyond Boundaries really does the whole, coordinates the whole process to bring the candidate into the country, from pro bono lawyers that are working on the immigration case uh, to many of the other aspects. We as a team were really quite engaged during this process, doing things like recording videos around the office and sharing them with Mohammed, celebrating each milestone that he crossed as he was preparing to come. Another nonprofit arranged for the donation of air miles to cover his flight. And when Mohammed walked through the gate at Toronto Pearson, we had this group assembled and there was just kind of, there was just so much joy. I mean, you always, we wanna have this kind of like big welcome for any new employee that joins our team, but there was a special, special level of connection because of the amount of back and forth trust building that had been in place to that point before Mohammed even arrived. I just wanna highlight again, this, you know, the reason why we have our Prime Minister meeting Mohammed is this is the first time this has ever happened. We were almost first in the world. Australia beat us to it by like three weeks or something like that with, uh, with a couple other Talent Beyond Boundaries candidates. And those are the only two countries in the world that have this uh, pathway available. Uh, Mohammed is the first in Canada to be resettled directly into employment as a refugee. 
So all of this, of course, was so that Mohammed could join our team. And it's something he was so eager to do that uh, the day after he arrived, he started showing up in our office, finding out about our tech stack, preparing to commit his first code. He just couldn't wait to contribute to what our team was doing. And while he was doing that, our team was ta taking turns, taking him around to see apartments, showing him the city and hel helping him figure out where he was going to uh, permanently uh, start building his life in town. Uh, and through this experience, we know that we want to do this again. We're currently preparing to hire the next couple people onto our engineering team through Talent Beyond Boundaries. We see sourcing part of our team talent through uh, the refugee candidate pool as very strategic. It's partly how we engage the world. It's also how we choose our best team composition, our best skills, our best culture on the team. And so we're making that part of our strategy for 2020. By starting the process now, we actually get to do a bunch of our hiring decisions and have things in place so that those team members arrive when uh, we're ready to add them in 2020. Mohammed's story has rightly generated a lot of interest. We didn't seek any of it. We actually were turning it away at the beginning. Uh, we didn't really want to turn this into a story for bonfire's sake. And then two officials from the UN High Commission for Refugees paid us a visit and they sat us down and they convinced us to start sharing the story to inspire wider impact. And most of them have been Mohammed and I together. Uh, we kind of joke that when we do one of these interviews, it's like, oh, we haven't caught up in a while, Mohammed. What's new with you? You know, I'm glad that we have another interview to do so we can find out what's happening in each other's lives. Um, and as we've done these interviews, our message has grown sharper and, and bolder. So I'm, I'm thrilled to say that the movement has grown beyond bonfire. Uh, we now in uh, Waterloo Region are looking to hire the next 10 skilled refugees into the tech sector. We see this as a community thing where uh, a number of companies have started the process, a number more are considering, and we're supporting each other both in the hiring process and in the process of welcoming the talent that we bring to the region. We believe that Waterloo Region could become the world capital for displaced tech talent. That we say to people who have the same skills as us around the world, this is the place that you should come if you cannot be in the place that you are. Come and work with us. So how do, do we grow the Atlantic innovation economy? Where could this fit in? Well, Atlantic Canada is uniquely suited to also be a world leader in this. If you caught it, there are only two countries in the world that support this, Canada and Australia. So you're already in the right country. You're also part of a growing, amazing tech sector. The fact that this conference is here, it's growing year over year, there's so many growth stories, that is another prerequisite. And the final one is that you've got a community that is welcoming, that understands this idea of bringing and resettling people being a part of your strength and your prosperity. Uh, in nearby Pictou County, Talent Beyond Boundaries is working across a number of sectors. Uh, the community is bringing 20 skilled refugees through Talent Beyond Boundaries to Pictou County with the first three medical professionals expected to arrive by the end of this year. So all the supports are in place at the federal and provincial levels. You have everything that you need. And so as you consider doing this, I uh, encourage you to get started quite simply. It really doesn't take a huge step to get started. You simply decide to include candidates from Talent Beyond Boundaries in your recruitment process. Take a look at the catalog, make selections, start to schedule interviews. And as you find your match and hire people from this refugee population onto your team, you'll find that you provide a way for them to uh, get their life moving forward again. You'll often find that the impact of that hiring decision impacts their family and their community as well. You'll discover that your whole team is brought together through the process. And I hope you discover that this is a way forward where we're all stronger together. So thank you for letting me share this with you.